Well, last week, uh, if you recall, we were casting a bunch of components uh, to lay switches with. And this week, we're actually going to be hand laying those very switches. And uh, that should be fun. A lot of people are pretty intimidated about the whole idea of hand laying switch tracks. But you know, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's, it's actually really, really fun and really rewarding. So check this out, hand laying switches on the railroad. Well, last week we were casting the bits and pieces we needed to lay switches in the switching yard. There we go. Which I always find interesting. It's fun. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that we have a complete casting setup here yeah. in the garage. It's um, not the sort of thing that most people have. No. So what we're casting here are, well, these are uh, point slide rail braces. Uh, last week I inaccurately said that Lagos Creek no longer makes them. Uh, uh, Brian and Mike over there said, no, they still make them. They were just out of stock for quite a while. But we still cast our own. This is what they look like on the real railroad. Oh, nice. And they, they hold the stock rail from being pushed out of uh, gauge by the points and the force of the train as it's coming through the switch. <laughs> this is a pretty random looking switch on the Rio Grande. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, later Rio Grande, uh, they weren't very careful about how they did things. And so we can get away with all kinds of fun and interesting things, but I don't want to make it look quite this, uh, quite this sketchy. A little bit worn. A little bit worn and a little haphazard. Uh, you can see that they use tie plates in some places. There's two tie plates here and then on the net, there's no tie plate. So I don't know if they were placed of uh, uh, ties and used tie plates or if they replaced ties and didn't use tie plates but one way or the other uh, and these ties that are over here aren't even cut to length. Now the Rio Grande did a little bit better on the tracks that they used a lot <laughs> and in this case we can see sort of their standard practice for building up uh, switch components. They did not use castings. They built all of their components out of rail by machining that down into shapes and then bolting the whole thing together. You can see that the frog here is made out of rail, uh, machined to a particular shape, and then it's all bolted together. And the guardrails are just simply rails bent and ground down at the ends and then bolted to the stock rails. At the switch points, you can see that they've ground it to almost wafer thinness uh, and given it a shape so that it tucks right up into the webbing of the stock rail so that they don't have to modify the stock rail in any way. The points are just going to slide right up in there. Now this area in between the points and the stock rail has to be kept open so you can't very well put a spike in here. So the gauging has to be held by these plates, these point slide rail braces, and you can see that they're really only designed to keep the rail from sliding outward. Uh, nothing is keeping it completely engaged moving inward, but all of the forces on this thing are pushing outward, so these work just fine. Now the points slide across this plate, hence the name point slide uh, <laughs> plate, but this metal area here is uh, placed there so that the points will slide across the metal instead of across the wood tie. Now in this case, notice that the, the slide portion of the plate is so wide it actually meets in the middle between the rails and then it's been welded together. So that's really going to keep the track engaged. Now over here we can see the linkage that holds the two points uh, in separation from each other and actually moves the points back and forth to redirect the train. Notice that the, uh, the point here, again, slides up into the stock rail. The stock rail has had no modification to it. There's no notching or changing or anything to the stock rail, only to the points. It's typical to see a notch here on a model railroad. Now, uh, some of these components have to be insulated so that they don't short the left and right tracks together. If the railroad is doing signaling, they can't very well short the two rails together. And we, we don't want to do that on our model railroad either. So our components that cross through between the two rails also have to be insulated. Now on the narrow gauge Rio Grande, there was no uh, centralized traffic control or anything. 
the switches were thrown with a switch stand. You would grab the handle and throw that and redirect the train in another direction. No powered switches. And so I want to also run all of my switches just from uh, prototype switch stands or prototype looking switch stands. This is the Lagos Creek kit and that's what I'm going to be using on the entire railroad are Lagos Creek switch stands. They work just like the real thing. I am casting some of my own switch stands out of white metal, but they're not going to be functional. They're just going to be decorative elements kind of placed in certain areas where having an abandoned switch stand will look fun and cool. You can see they're not nearly as detailed as the Lagos Creek switch stand. And again, they're quite flimsy. If I tried actually locking a switch in place with them after a few throws, I'd probably break the stand where the Lagos Creek stand is pretty much indestructible. And it comes with the entire kit, uh, the links and the handle and everything and it all builds up into a really sweet looking switch stand. And then I'm casting my own switch lanterns and I've got a diabolical system for building lenses for those and I'll show you guys that out of, out of acrylic rod. But I am casting up a bunch of switch lanterns because I want all of my switch stands to have switch lanterns. Now as it happens, I can't find a, a proper gauge uh, for building switches with. Uh, NMRA makes those for other scales, but not this scale, not that I could find. So instead I purchased a couple of used Lagos Creek switches, and I'm going to be using those as a template and then just matching what I build to those. Now I had Warren James cut me out a bunch of really long ties, about seven inches long, longer than I needed. But that way I can cut those down to the exact lengths that I need. Very few of these ties uh, going through the switches are the exact same length. So then I was able to lay that out and build up my switches and set everything in place and glue my ties down where they belong to create the crossover that will go between tracks one and two in the yard and got all my ties laid out and then just a matter of doing like we did uh, when we first started laying track staining all of these with some uh, Watco dark walnut stain and then overpainting that with some uh, light gray acrylic to create a, a nice weathered appearance for my my ties. Now I used to build my switches by laying the frog first but I've decided it's better to lay the straight stock rail first. And again, it's just plain rail, so this is easy. I put down the stock rail, making sure it's absolutely straight. I also put the point slide rail braces in here. Shouldn't have done that, should have saved that for later. Now, as I mentioned before, I wanna lay most of the railroad with tie plates, but on the back track, couldn't quite figure out how to go about that and couldn't reach it well. But I've come up with a technique for putting in the tie plates. The key is don't spike it down at all tight as you're working. That way you can easily slide tie plates under the rail and then come back later and tighten the whole thing up. At any rate, I now have my stock rail nice and straight and spiked into place and I'm ready to set the frog. The very first thing I had to do was clean the casting up uh, because it comes delivered with the sprue and everything on it. So I used a Dremel with a cutoff wheel to cut away the, the gate, the sprue, and uh, that leaves some significant grinding marks and so then I needed to machine this down nice and flat and straight and uh, uh, I don't have a milling machine so I actually did all of this work just on my uh, bench mounted uh, belt sander and uh, it will actually take the metal down and that way I can get it all nice and square and straight and clean. It's critical to also make sure that the webbing is all open so that you can easily attach uh, rails to your frog. Anyway, once I had it all cleaned up, over to the paint booth for a coat of grimy brown, rusty, gooey paint, and then wiped off the top and bottom of this with some thinner to get it down to the clean metal. And now I'm ready to set my frog in place. I'm checking my spacings with a micrometer but I'm mostly using the snap-on gauges that I got from Micro Engineering. 
and that way I can ensure that my frog is exactly engaged to the straight stock rail and nice and square to it. I'm using the tape measure here to ensure that my frog point is exactly uh, the right distance from the switch points. Again, I'm taking all of these measurements off of the Logus Creek switches that I have. Now that I have my frog and my straight stock rail in place, I'm ready to lay the two rails that come off of the frog. And I have to put an electrical gap here because the polarity of the frog is going to change when you throw the switch. The polarity of the rails coming off the frog is going to be continuous. So every time you throw the switch, it will short out if you don't have an electrical gap here. So I'm just leaving a little space there and then I'm going to come back and put a little wedge of styrene plastic in there to ensure that these never touch. Probably styrene or I could use some epoxy glue. And I'm now ready to spike the rail that comes off of the frog. I can spike it for several feet past the switch if I want to. I do have to, of course, make sure that it's true to the straight stock rail in gauge and also quite straight. Also notice that I don't have any tie plates opposite the frog on the straight stock rail because I'm going to be placing guardrails here. And so those spikes are actually just temporary. I'm going to have to fashion some special tie plates for that area once I make the guardrails. So I just have that temporarily spiked in place and that's why there are no uh, tie plates in that area. And now I'm ready to spike the other rail that comes off of the frog. As this is a crossover, it will continue straight for a short distance and then become the curved stock rail of the second switch. So I'm only going to spike it a short distance through the straight part of the rail. I've snapped a few gauges in place just to hold the rails there. I'm not spiking anything down just yet. First, I need to spike down the curved stock rail of the switch that I'm working on. This, of course, has to be kept engaged to the frog and the opposing rail. And now I'm ready to set my switch points. These are the castings, again, from Logus Creek for the two switch points. Here again, they have the casting sprue in place, and that will need to be cut away but they're also not terribly uh, straight or flat. So they need to be straightened and flattened and little burrs and imperfections removed. Again, I used my belt sander for that and then came back with a metal file. This was particularly important at the tip where uh, the points need to be able to tuck neatly up into the stock rail and ensure proper closure between the points and the stock rail. But if you get that cleaned up just right, notice it'll just tighten right up against the stock rail and make nice clean points. Can't do that once it's mounted. You have to do that now while they're separate. As you can see, they cleaned up quite nicely on the belt sander and they now tuck neatly up into my stock rails. Now I also placed some rail joiners uh, at the back end of these, and that's where the short lengths of a rail will attach the closure rails that connect the points to the frog. And that's how I will attach those is with that rail joiner. I thought about soldering these in place, but it's a little bit difficult soldering this heavy rail, and I think the rail joiners look just fine. Now the straight points are opposite the straight stock rail, and that was quite easy to get that to tuck right in place and really easy to align because just like the straight stock rail, it's perfectly straight and in uh, alignment and gauge with the straight stock rail. But the curved points, uh, that's a little bit trickier. And I actually ended up spending about two hours messing around getting my points to close neatly up in there and follow the exact curve of the curved stock rail. And I'm now ready to cut out and seat my closure rails, measured the distance here and cut the rail for the straight closure rail and set that in place. And then once it was spiked, I was able to screw around with it a little bit and roll the car back and forth. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm now ready to set my curved closure rail and spike down the curved stock rail. I haven't spiked that down yet. And what I'm going to do is hold both of them engage and spike them together. That way I can create an easement between the points and the frog. That is to say, the curvature gradually becomes curvature instead of just suddenly bending. The amount of curvature, of course, set by the angle of the frog. Once I have my stock rails in place, I can go ahead and build and set my guard rails that sit exactly opposite the frog. They catch the backside of the wheel flange and keep the wheel from going down the wrong side of the frog. So they're very important. Now you can see that the Rio Grande has created some custom tie plates here. They're just sheets of metal punched out. Um, because you need an extra wide tie plate here to hold both the stock rail and the guard rail. So what I did is I just took a couple of my tie plates and cut them down so that I could hook two of them end to end to create those extra long tie plates that I needed for the guard rails. The spacing between the guard rail and the stock rail is fairly critical. I uh, took a measurement off the existing Logos Creek switch that I have and tried to match that. Once I had my guardrails in place, I uh, pulled some trains through here, not, not with power. I just rolled trains back and forth through here to see how it would behave and found that my uh, spacing here was actually too wide and the wheels were trying to pick the frog and go in the wrong direction. So I shortened the guardrails and also tightened up the spacing by a couple of thousandths of an inch. And at that point, the switch worked perfectly. Well, there it is, a finished switch. That is interesting. Isn't it fun? I just get the biggest kick out of building something that, that looks so nice and real and in fact works great. That's wonderful. Uh, now I need to figure out how to hook up the switch stand to the switch and that's going to be a, an upcoming show because there has to be a whole linkage that connects the points to the switch stand. Interesting because I've never seen this done before. I've watched it in operation but never seen it put together. Well and everybody's got a technique that they use on their model railroad and then there's the prototype. Oh. And I'd rather come closer to the prototype so I'm experimenting. Yes. I'm experimenting trying to come up with some linkages and I took a lot of pictures when we were in Durango of the actual linkages that they used there uh, in an attempt to duplicate as close as possible this kind of thing where that band ties the points together and then that whole thing ties it to the switch stand but on the model it also has to keep the points from riding up i see and so uh, it has to function a little differently here's the most famous switch on the entire rio grande oh uh this is the switch right next to mcdonald's in durango mcdonald's <laughs> <laughs> and everybody stands here and takes pictures of the trains when they arrive in town it's a spring switch and it automatically diverts the trains over to the depot. And it's right there at the road crossing by the McDonald's. And so everybody stands right here. They don't take a picture of the switch like I did. They take a picture of the train instead. <laughs> anyway, so far so good. It works just fine. It looks like it. And it's fun rolling the cars back and forth through here. So that's how you lay switches. Um, <laughs> or you lay a switch. A switch. And we're going to lay three more switches. Uh, not part of the show, but by the time at some point you'll, we'll have three more switches in the yard. What we're going to move on to now is building and setting up switch stands for all four switches. Because it's all going to be manual switches. <laughs> so that'll, that'll be the next uh, show that we do on track lane. Mm -hmm. At least we'll be on now how to uh, set up operation on the switch to a manual switch stand. <laughs> anyway, if you haven't been over to the channel, do pop over to the channel. And if you're not a subscriber, here comes the blue <laughs> button. Are we ready for it? Zoink! Right there, the blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Tuesday. Because we have something fun to show you. No way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you then. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.